So hello and welcome everyone to our free GitOps workshop with an introduction to Kubernetes and GitOps. My name is Stacy Potter. I'm a community manager here at WeaveWorks and uh, we've allotted about two hours for today's session, uh, but these sessions have typically been around 90 minutes or so. Uh, although today's session may run the full two hours because we do have Kingdon Barrett, our open source support engineer here, uh, to give you a quick introduction to Kubernetes and GitOps for those who are new to both. Uh, then we'll have Jordi Mon Companies, our product marketing manager, who will be giving you an overview of Weave GitOps and what to expect. Then David Harris, one of our PMs, will be going through the actual steps of the Getting Started Guide. We'll also have a couple of folks from our engineering team, Mark Emeis and James Wilson in the background, who are here and uh, will be behind the scenes to help you if you're stuck or have any questions on chat. So we are really excited that you are here. A little bit of background, if this is your first time coming to one of these events, uh, we've been running these for a couple of weeks now or a couple of months now, every few weeks or so. Uh, the company that we work for is called WeWorks, so welcome if you haven't heard of us. We're a startup with offices all over the world, uh, San Francisco, New York, London, Berlin, as well as remote teams. Uh, and a lot of what we do is based on open source. Uh, you might have heard of our projects uh, Flux and Flagger, which are in the CNCF. And Flux was the project that really kicked off the term that we coined, GitOps. And it's really been cool to watch watch it just spread like wildfire over the many years. Uh, Cortex is another one of our projects that is in the CNCF that helps make Prometheus scalable. I mentioned that because Prometheus is a key part of the progressive delivery possibilities with Flagger. That's uh, one key option that we have. And we have many, many more. So if you're interested, definitely check us out on GitHub under WeaveWorks, as well as the CNCF, where you can find our projects. And to learn more about us, you can always visit our website, weave.works. And today we'll be talking about our latest product that we're really excited about that is also open source, and it's called uh, Weave GitOps. Of course, we are a company that has paid products, so you'll be able to see the different tiers with Weave GitOps. Uh, the highest level, of course, is enterprise, but today we'll be talking about the actual getting started steps to, um, to the open source bits that will give you, you know, uh, get you started. And hopefully, if you're new to GitOps, it'll give you a, a really good sense of, of how it works. So an important part of this is that Flux, the open source project that I mentioned, that's in the CNCF, is really the engine beneath that. In fact, we have an upcoming GitOps Days Community Special Edition event uh, the week after KubeCon on October 20th, where we'll be talking about how exciting it is that companies like Microsoft, AWS, VMware, and D2IQ, uh, formerly known as Mesosphere, have all created GitOps offerings with Flux as their key engine. So we'll have various speakers talking about those different option offerings, as well as, uh, as our offering, we've given which you're previewing today. And all of these are powered by Flux. And we believe that it really is the most powerful GitOps tool out there. And it's been really exciting to see the Flux community grow as well as the Flux ecosystem grow. So this is a great part of, uh, of this journey. And whatever GitOps solution or option uh, you, that you know, it's, uh, it's powered by Flux. So you can definitely We'll, we'll be more than happy to um, answer any questions about that. If you'd like to read more about this GitOps one-stop shop event and sign up, please head on over to gitopsdays.com and you can sign up there and read more about it. So a couple of housekeeping bits. As I mentioned before, we've bookmarked bookmarked about two hours for today's session. And I'm sure I don't have to explain too much about Zoom these days, but the one thing I will mention um, is that unless you have something burningly private to share in the chat, um, be sure to change the two to everyone or all panelists and attendees, but I think that they changed it to say everyone now so that um, everyone in the audience can see your question or comments. Sometimes we have uh, members of our audience that are actually able to answer questions. So please make sure you do that. All right, so this is the overview. Uh, we'll do about 15 to 20 minutes for anyone who's new to Kubernetes and GitOps and with, uh, with Kingdon Barrett, 
then hand it over to Je uh, Jordi and David for the Weave GitOps overview and walkthrough of the Getting Started docs, uh, which you can follow along with. Uh, this red arrow is pointing you to our key product page, weave.works slash product slash GitOps dash core. We say core because that's the open source free part of Weave GitOps, uh, but that's the whole offering. So here again is the same link at the top for the product page, and uh, we'll be going through these specific docs, and I'll put all of these in the chat for you as well. So um, also, if you can and you'd like to chat with us on our Slack channel, um, please join here. Again, I'll paste it into the chat. So I think that's it for me in my intro, and I will uh, stop sharing and hand it over to you, Kingdon. Great, thanks. Get my screen share up here. Absolutely. And get my presenter notes. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Kingdon. And today I'm going to be presenting a brief introduction to GitOps through Kubernetes. Uh, so um, the idea of this presentation is, is to show, sorry, full screen here. Um, for people who are um, not necessarily familiar with Kubernetes yet, um, what is Kubernetes and what is the value that it delivers and why is that so closely tied to GitOps? And, and uh, why do we have to explain Kubernetes in order to explain GitOps? Um, so, um, I'm Kingdon, uh, as Stacy already said. Um, I'm an open source support engineer at Weaveworks. I'm a Helm and Kubernetes enthusiast. Uh, I have been um, in the Kubernetes community for a long time and I'm open source contributor to many projects, including Flux. Um, and you can find me uh, as the cow on Twitter or um, several other places. Um, so to jump right into it, um, we're going to cover these two topics. What is Kubernetes and what is GitOps? Um, and I'm going to go through in a little bit of detail before we get to the rest of the slides. Um, we are going to talk a little bit uh, more technical than maybe you would prefer for a uh, introductory talk, but um, this is a technical topic, so it's a little bit unavoidable. Um, and and uh, just for starters, there's a bunch of technical jargon in here. Um, Kubernetes is uh, for container clusters. So Kubernetes is a modern operational stack for uh, running your software on the cloud. Um, but Kubernetes is more than just that. Kubernetes is uh, an API. So Kubernetes is a technical spec. Um, there are these resources that if you're not familiar with, uh, you're going to become very familiar with as you go into your journey and, and learn about Kubernetes, uh, such as namespaces, pods, and services that are in the, the heart and core of the Kubernetes API. Um, but that's not all that the API has in it. Uh, it has, like I said, um, lots of jargon here. Uh, many of these will be familiar. Uh, some might be unfamiliar. Events, secrets, config, uh, config maps, and um, applications. Uh, storage, coordination, uh, discovery, all of these are, are in scope for the Kubernetes API. Uh, jobs, certificates, networking, role-based access control. So there's a lot of stuff in here. Um, and and uh, all of that bears uh, worth further explanation, um, but there's more. Um, in terms of what, what does Kubernetes deliver in, in the API spec, uh, it also delivers this capacity for extensibility. So things that aren't in the Kubernetes API can be added. Um, and, and this is the uh, capability that enables software like Flux and, and with GitOps to do the job um, of, of GitOps. So what is GitOps? Uh, well, at a 10,000, 30,000, very high level, uh, we needed something to wrangle all of that complexity. And, and that is GitOps. Um, so GitOps is a cloud native uh, set of best practices for Kubernetes. Uh, it's a specific methodology for um, building clusters and, and uh, deploying workloads on them. And it uses Git. 
Uh, it's in the name. You probably already knew that. Uh, Git is a version controlled immutable uh, storage system. Um, commits are immutable. And uh, you're probably familiar with Git. Um, uh, if you're not, uh, it's, it's certainly uh, an important part of GitOps. It's not um, strictly required that you use Git in order to use GitOps, but it, it helps. Uh, it's very similar to the way that Kubernetes is not strictly required for GitOps, but it helps. There, there are a lot of parts that make um, this uh, pairing work well. Uh, and and uh, without belaboring it, since we're still only on the introductory slide here, um, this concept of declarative configuration is going to come back and we're going to repeat this throughout the uh, throughout the presentation. So um, back to Kubernetes. What is Kubernetes exactly? Uh, so Kubernetes is an open source platform for operations. Um, and it is subdivided into these sort of uh, technical parts uh, at a higher level than deployments and, and uh, pods and all those technical jargon. You have your control plane, uh, which is where the API runs. You have your data plane, uh, which is what I'll, I'll just a term for what I'll use for where your applications run, and you have the applications themselves or your workloads. Um, but Kubernetes is is not strictly a uniform experience. Uh, there there are different distributions of Kubernetes. There are different experiences that are possible depending on which distribution or service provider you're using to get your Kubernetes. Um, and there are beyond that, even within the same service provider and distribution, uh, there are um, options for self-hosted or managed that can drastically change your experience with Kubernetes, depending on which one you choose. And also many configuration options where a cluster for a dev environment or a production environment might make sense to configure one way or another. Um, but uh, Kubernetes at its core, uh, is built around this concept of a conformance test. So it is very easy to look at something and say whether this is or is not Kubernetes. And, and within that set of conformance tests, uh, you can be reasonably guaranteed that things are going to be the same from one Kubernetes distribution to the next. So that uh, the experience can vary from one cloud provider to the next, but mostly it is the same across all cloud providers. So this is an important part of Kubernetes. Um, and what is that the same experience? Again, at an extremely high level, um, this is the core concept that repeats itself throughout Kubernetes. You have controllers, which are a form of software agent that are performing a job of reconciling uh, your cluster and the workloads on it toward a desired state. Um, the desired state is expressed through declarative configuration in the form of YAML files. Um, so uh, we have a, a YAML file that describes a deployment, for example, of a containerized application. Um, and, and that's uh, uh, fairly uh, straightforward on its face, at least. Uh, but as, as it gets into the details, there can be uh, many different things that happen along the way. And the controller is what drives the state of the cluster towards the desired state that's described um, in, in whatever way is necessary. Um, so at uh, take a step down to a little bit more detail, we're gonna start with a bad example to show what is um, technically possible in Kubernetes, but doesn't really um, fit the mold that we're uh, expecting people to use in Kubernetes. Uh, so the mold, we mentioned declarative configuration before, and, and the mold is declarative configuration. So the bad example that I'm providing here is uh, we're going to declare a pod, and the pod has a container spec inside of it. And why is this a bad example? Because um, pod is not really uh, a useful infrastructure primitive in a declarative sense. Uh, pods have a life cycle, so the pod has a state. It can be in one of these states. It can be pending. Uh, it hasn't been scheduled yet. It can be succeeded, uh, or it can be running continuously. And it can have all these states in between. And uh, so a pod by itself is only part of the puzzle 
uh, pod definition is not declarative uh, when you call it by its name. This is an imperative operation. If you were to say, I would like a pod, um, it says nothing about how long the pod should live or whether it should be restarted, if it should exit. Um, it is a one and done operation. So a better example is a deployment. Um, I thought I had more transitions between these. I'm sorry, there's a little bit more uh, verbiage on the slide than I would like to have all at once. But uh, deployment, this, this is basically the same thing, but in a declarative way. Um, and, and there are a few opportunities for knobs because we're doing this declaratively. Uh, so we go back to the pod definition. We just define a pod and it has a container in it, maybe one or more containers. Um, but once it's started, it just runs until it stops and then it goes away. A deployment is not usually expected to exit unless uh, the pods encounter some error condition. And when they should exit, they will be restarted. Um, so that, that is uh, under the hood, what is a deployment and what is a deployment for? Uh, I apologize if this is really basic for people who uh, have already experienced Kubernetes and have um, knowledge about this stuff, but uh, I wanna make sure this is really accessible and build it up for people who aren't necessarily in that position. Um, so I'm gonna go, like I said, into a little bit more detail about some of the technical things than uh, you might expect in an intro talk, but we're building up to uh, control loops again. So a deployment has a sub resource called a replica set and the replica set is what defines pods. And, and basically a replica set is a number of copies of a pod um, and the number is determined by this uh, replicas count. So it's an immutable specification. And what that means is if we need another pod with a different configuration, say we've released a new version of our software and it has a new image, we're going to update our deployment specification, which is going to result in a new replica set being created uh, because the deployment specification for the pod template is um, not immutable. It can be changed. Uh, and this is part of the life cycle of pods uh, in a deployment. So we'll create new replica set. Something will happen that causes the replica set to be scaled up and health checks will be engaged. And by the time the um, replica set is ready, the old one can be scaled down. And this all happens uh, behind the scenes for you. So really all you know and experience as a user is, I updated my deployment template and the deployment created some new pods for me and now the new specification is running. Uh, so we, uh, we use these declarative primitives rather than declaring pods one at a time when we need them. We, we declare these infrastructure objects like deployment um, to rescue us from managing the imperative life cycle of pods. And um, the Kubernetes controller manager is the component of Kubernetes that handles this control loop for all of the core API resources. So it drives all of the resources such as pods that may or may not exist yet to their desired state. Uh, I think I skipped a little bit ahead in my description here, but so at the end of the story, um, pods are created from the replica set. They hopefully become ready. And again, the pods are immutable uh, in, in their definition. So they can't be changed in place. They, they are thrown away and replaced when you need a new pod, just like the replica set. So you have other opportunities to use pods in different ways that may not behave in the same configuration. You can create jobs, you can create cron jobs that are like a job, except they execute uh, on a repeated basis, on a schedule, a uh, job fires once. Um, this is different than just declaring a pod because if your pod fails, um, then it just descends into a failed state and nothing else happens. But if your job fails, that's an error condition and the job will re-execute until it succeeds um, or depending on how you've configured it. There, there may be uh, different reasons that you would configure it one way or another. A stateful set is another example. It's like a deployment, but stateful. 
uh, and it has an identity. So you can have more than one and they're bound to persistent volumes. Um, this is probably a lot more detail than is really necessary at this point. Um, I think I've explained sufficiently what Kubernetes is to go into what is, um, what is GitOps and where does that fit in? So, so uh, that's what we're gonna move on to now. Where does GitOps fit in? So back up to the question of what is GitOps exactly? And I think that there's one, one question we can ask that will help paint a picture of exactly what is GitOps for anyone who's not completely clear on the idea. And the question is, what would it look like if your desired state for your entire cluster or system was represented as a single artifact? Uh, and, and the spoiler, that artifact is a git commit. Um, so what would it look like? There are lots of benefits uh, to operating this way. You gain greater visibility into your operational processes and deployment. Uh, you, you can look at that git commit and see what is deployed or what, what is intended to be deployed at any given time. Um, simplifies a lot of security questions. Now, if all of your uh, operations come from the git repository, then the question of how do I secure the cluster can be a lot simpler. I only need to secure the Git repository um, and then the cluster can be satisfactorily locked down um, where you don't need to hand access to a lot of different people. They can just interact with the Git repository. Um, this also uh, gives benefits for compliance. So these are all benefits for the business side, um, but there are many benefits for developers as well. Uh, it's easier to do deploys when you only have to think about one thing interacting with a Git repository. Um, you can repeat the same deployment locally. You can take what you have uh, built and, and put it on another cluster and reuse the same artifacts um, from the Git repository. Uh, it reduces a lot of the knowledge that's required to interact with the cluster. Um, Excuse me. So you do not need uh, to have direct write access to the cluster in order to use GitOps. You can write to the Git repository and let uh, the cluster agents, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but let the cluster agents take care of it for you. Um, and also for platform teams. So um, there are a lot of things in what we would call a traditional CI CD pipeline. If you're using Kubernetes and you're not using GitOps, there are a lot of things that become a lot easier as a platform team. Uh, you don't need scripts that apply manifests to your cluster at a point in time. Um, this, this is done by our GitOps solution. Um, there can be uh, reduced permissions similarly and, and rollbacks are easier. You don't necessarily need to run uh, CI again in order to perform a rollback. You can just take the artifacts from the previous commit and let them be deployed. Uh, it's easier to track changes and uh, you can use this strategy to standardize delivery across a bunch of teams. So platform teams don't usually just support one team. Uh, this, this makes the interface between a platform team and other teams much simpler so they can scale better. So back to our original question, um, what would it look like if the desired state of an entire cluster was represented as a single artifact? And we've already spoiled that it is a Git commit that we're talking about uh, with Kubernetes YAML manifests inside. Um, so that is GitOps in a nutshell, but GitOps is more than only that. GitOps is, is um, a set of guiding principles as well. So, um, I'm just going to borrow this slide from uh, another uh, place that I've seen it used. Um, these are the principles of GitOps according to the Open uh, GitOps Working Group, and I'm not 100% sure that I have the latest version of these principles. I apologize if, if they're out of date, uh, but they're um, basically these five principles, which I still think is a bit of a mouthful. Um, so I'm going to boil them down in the next slide to a little bit less. Um, and then we'll build back up to this uh, rather than try to go through each one here on the slide. Um, 
seen a picture of them at least. So, so what did we just see on that last slide? Well, at the core, it's this idea of declarative configuration. We've already gone into a bit of detail about um, that it's expressed in a means of a version controlled immutable artifact. So that can be Git or some other similarly structured tool. And it's this concept of a single source of truth. So uh, we're not pulling configuration from a bunch of different surprising places. Uh, we have a Git repository and we put our configuration into it. And that's where the configuration comes from. It's a single source of truth. Um, so, so that's most of GitOps. I'd say that's about, maybe that's about a third of GitOps. Um, this is an important point that cannot be understated. Um, automated delivery. So if you just add Git to your cluster um, preparation workflow and um, do nothing else, it will drastically improve a lot of things, uh, but it will set you back a little bit too, because um, automated delivery makes is what makes this easy. If, if you can expect what's at the latest commit of a branch is actually deployed on the cluster, that's what makes this actually easy. So automated delivery is an important part of this. Uh, and again, it's delivery of declarative resources. So uh, just to restate, um, as we've said a couple of times, imperative actions, no. You don't want to do anything imperatively if we can avoid it. Um, we're going to let these agents running in the cluster, whether they be Flux or Weave GitOps or um, another similar tool, act and uh, reconcile our definition in the Git repository with what the cluster is configured for. So as you push a new commit into Git, the cluster is going to pull it into the desired configuration of the cluster. And, and then the Kubernetes um, controller manager and, and friends will take action to make it reality. And um, that final principle, uh, sometimes disputed, is the closed loop. This says that once you've um, adopted GitOps, you should eschew any other way of configuring your cluster. Uh, you do not want configuration drift. This is one of the reasons why you adopted GitOps, was so that you could point at the Git repository and say, that's what's defined and that's what's running in the cluster. So uh, once, once you've adopted the strategy, you probably don't want people to go in and change things in the cluster randomly. That's part of the whole um, proposition here. So I know some people are uh, pictorial learners and, and um, I'm not sure how much this is going to help to go into more depth about, but um, we'll go into uh, pictographic representation of what we just described and where those principles are represented here. Um, so here's your developer writing code and committing it to Git. And here are our um, controller reconcilers um, that happen outside of the cluster to copy our desired configuration into the cluster. And also um, some information comes back into those reconcilers um, from the cluster. So, so there's communication back and forth between these. And, and um, with, uh, I think all of the implementations that we're really concerned about today, this all actually happens inside of the cluster. So again, our system is declarative. Uh, it's version controlled. This is our Git. And there's automated delivery that happens through software agents. It happens in a closed loop with the delivered system, Kubernetes. Um, the time is 1 p.m. It's time for lunch. Remember to wash your hands. Big pardon, Google's. Um, so so uh, this is a picture of our traditional uh, deployment mechanism um, built up. So we've got our Kubernetes API. This is a little bit different than what we described. This is probably a little bit closer to what uh, you have if you are doing continuous delivery without GitOps now. Um, we have the Kubernetes API and we have our CI system that has something that builds Docker containers in it. And those Docker containers go to a registry uh, of images where images are kept and something in CI deploys them. Um, this is where we start to diverge with what GitOps is actually doing. Um, there is nothing in CI that's deploying our new images. Again, this happens 
uh, from inside of the cluster um, via Git. So the instructions go to the cluster in Git and the cluster uh, enforces our desired configuration as it's described in Git. Uh, those represent some credentials. So those go away in our GitOps model. We don't have uh, direct write credentials for the cluster. I think this diagram probably explains it better than I said before. Um, you don't need this anymore. So that's one way this can be more secure. Uh, and Git over here, of course, Git is still involved, even though um, this is before GitOps. We have developers committing to Git, pushing changes to CI, which builds images, pushes them to the registry, cube control applies them to the cluster, and the image comes from the cluster. So um, in summary, um, this, this is what we've just talked about. Uh, we, we have a Git-centric way of implementing continuous delivery that we're going to show in the next uh, few uh, segments. And, and we've got lots of benefits that we hope to get out of using this um, Git ops strategy. We will have increased productivity for developers, improved stability, uh, better experience, um, higher reliability. All of these are, are really important um, to help your organization deliver software faster and, and uh, compete. Um, and we've talked about the five principles of GitOps and uh, briefly touched on how GitOps itself can help us overcome um, some of the problems that are encountered in traditional CI CD systems. Um, I don't know if we will stop for questions here or. Um... I mean, we did have a few folks who are uh, new to to Kubernetes and to GitOps. So I will encourage everyone if, um, if you do have any questions about Kubernetes or GitOps, if you have anything, please um, please type them in the uh, in the chat. Um, and otherwise, we can uh, move on to uh, to Jordy and Kingdon if you want to pop in the chat or um, or hop off altogether. Uh, appreciate it. Oh, so we have someone coming in and saying uh, GitOps builds Docker, Docker images from Docket file or Docker file, Docket file, and push images to the registry, is that correct? Well, that's a part of GitOps, um, but it's it's uh, the CI part is what I would say. Um, so part of uh, our, our whole model is to separate CI and CD. So building an image is a CI responsibility um, and pushing it to the registry um, and also testing the image. Those are all what I consider CI responsibilities and then um, decoupling that from CD or um, taking a already tested image and putting it into production, um, that is part of what GitOps is about. Which actually also answers King, the, the previous question is that if we, I think the you there in Taras Novak's question is the product, we have GitOps, if it, if it does CD via GitHub Actions and I mean, I'm not sure how what via GitHub Actions means, but to connect it with what Kingdom just said, if you use Actions as a CI pipeline, so uh, uh, you know a, a set of actions that builds the software into an artifact, stores it in Docker Hub elsewhere in an artifactory, and then updates the declared state that Kingdom just mentioned, the YAML file saying, hey, you know what, the last version of the of the workload of the application is stored there with with hash x. Then is when uh, we've GitOps kicks in and does the CD part. So CI with actions in one side, CD on the other side uh, as a continuous pipeline, but with separations of concerns like Kingdom just said. So should we move on to the demo then? Yeah, I think. I think this is a great time to segue into that. Uh, just got another yeah. uh, question in. If we want to just read this off real quick, and then we can, and then we can start off with yours, Jordy. What is the difference between GitOps and just CI, and then just triggering a new deployment with the next pipeline, which will be triggered after a successful build and potentially any sign-offs, i.e., the CD part. Well, Kingdom, do you, do you want to? 
Sure. Uh, yeah. Um, the biggest difference is uh, in what happens in a disaster recovery scenario, in my opinion. Um, and there might be other places where there are important differences, but um, when, when you have a CI system that triggers deployments uh, as part of CI and CD, and they're mashed together like that, um, what you wind up with is a system that requires CI in order to reproduce itself. Uh, and that means that if, if you have one application, this may not be a very big deal. Um, if you have a small build pipeline, you know, um, you can be reasonably confident that you can run it again and get another image out of it. Um, this might not be a huge deal, but where it really becomes important is when things start to grow. Um, and, and when you mention sign-offs, um, we have uh, really good facilities for that in, in Git. Uh, and software like GitHub has uh, and GitLab all have uh, pull requests. So, so uh, we consider that you can use pull requests as your sign-offs. Um, and, and make that the place where um, we decide whether things go to production or not. Also, doubling down on the argument of scale, which is what uh, Kingdon was saying, okay, if you've got one application, fine, build the image. Even if it's broken, you can build it again, probably reproduce it, and then manually take it into the environment which is running Kubernetes. What about when you've got 10? What about when you've got 100 workloads, right? The good thing about with GitOps is that it, and it, it makes that CD process completely automated, right? It's checking constantly for change and not requiring for a manual trigger to, to update the workload in production or in the environment, in testing, in dev, whatever. It will be checking for changes. So if you've got one application, fine, you can do it yourself, you, your team. If you've got 100, then you'd better rely on something like this because it will save you time, among other things. But uh, but on the argument of a scale, it really helps a lot. Fabulous. And uh, they followed up saying, I'm not talking about manual work at all, except for sign-offs, but the sign-offs may be mandated by external factors, for example, regulatory. Mark, did you have something to add? I, I was just going to kind of piggyback on what Scott put in the chat there about the drift aspect. So one of the key parts of GitOps is the, the reconciliation loop. So it's not only about changes in your uh, configuration at the Git level, but it's also verifying that the cluster still matches what your configuration is. So a lot of people, when they're troubleshooting something, they go in and start hacking around on things. Uh, and you end up with a cluster that's in, an, that's in a in a broken state and you don't know why because you can never remember what all the changes you were. And so with GitOps, what it does is it, it kind of enforces that reconciliation loop from Git. So you're, so it's going to reset your cluster back to what the configuration is set as. And in this, both CI and CD are more, they can try and reapply that at a certain interval, but they're not doing the reconciliation step. So that's really a key differentiator with GitOps. And also in terms of regulatory or compliance setups, there's two things, TM, TM asked about this. Uh, so one, you can build your merge requests in GitLab, your pull requests in GitHub, whatever they are called in Bitbucket. You can build in, build in into the merge request process, into the pull request process, uh, enough sign-offs, enough visibility to each one of the stakeholders. So people that need to be informed people that need to approve code changes, owners of code, et cetera, that can be built into. And then Git will have, or the Git providers will have the track record, the record of each one of these approvals, right? It's got this audit trail, not only at the Git commit and the Git log level, but inside of the Git uh, services that I just mentioned, there's more granularity to that. And also in terms of Weave GitOps, although I'm not sure is, it's included in the in we've get in we've get ups core well, it will be in the future probably it's that you can if you got regulatory um or compliance requirements to build um environments in 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 a specific way that include specific policies i'm thinking of data protection policies and so forth uh we've get ups is able to build from git those clusters that match a specific 
regulation, right? And those would be policies. And that, that's also part of the product. It's completely different from the change approvals and the sign-offs, but it's also a regulatory capability of our product. Fantastic. All right, Jory, why don't we go ahead and, and get into sure. your, well, we can, we can, it looks like these are just comments and some, okay. uh, some questions that we can address later. So, yeah. Do you all see my screen, by the way? Yes. Fantastic. It's on Ravi's article. <laughs> what? Oh, no. <laughs> well, by the way, Ravi, thanks so much. <laughs> I just, I just switched straight, allow me to do it again. I, I, I've got that, uh, that pending read. So Ravi, thanks a lot for sharing that. I'll share it on, on Twitter and elsewhere later, but I need to read it first. Uh, so now you can see my, my presentation, right? Looks good, thanks. Okay, so the two protagonists of the remaining part of the, of the presentation are these two fellas, that's me on the left, I'm a product marketing director over here at uh, uh, Weaveworks and David Harris. Do you want to say hello, David? Hi, folks. David I'll say Harris. more hello later. <laughs> I'll let you do your spiel first. Yeah, actually, we'll do the 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 good bit. Uh, the what we're all here for the the demo. So I'll be very fast because actually, you know, um, uh, Stacy went through what the company is, where we come from, with the original GitOps company. I, I uh, I like that term, to be honest. It's not because we coined it in a way, but it's be it because we coined it after uh, making, it's a realization process, right? It's after many, many years of contributing to the CNCF projects that Stacy mentioned, and uh, I won't go through, uh, after working ourselves in the Kubernetes space that we realized that operations by pull request Right, so something that TM was actually asking that sign off process applied not only to the application development process or the configuration changes, but also to the operations. Right, instead of do connecting manually to the environments and changing those with scripts and so forth, running it through pull requests, running it through merge requests, right, and all the different stages and approval processes that that needs uh, in place. It's after doing that ourselves, for ourselves, that we realized that the GitOps term made a lot of sense, right? Uh, as a company, we've got several important people involved, the CEO and founder, which was involved in the, C in the Cloud Native Computing Foundations uh, Foundation, uh, was, the, it was the TOC uh, at some point, actually, I think the first one, uh, Projects, as you can see in the center column here, like the ones that um, uh, Stacy mentioned, so Flux, we've GitOps, the one we're going to uh, demo today, but also EKS Cuttle, in case you use e AWS EKS, that's also contributed by us, uh, important clients, and blah, 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 right? So a solid company that is behind this, it has been doing it for ages now, and that we plan to do it in, in the future for, for more time. So what I, I'm... I'm trying to elaborate on this historical, this this long term, long time player in the cloud native environment because we've got a lot of data and although we've served a lot of clients throughout these years, that has allowed us to become well fairly familiar with uh, the term GitOps and trying to be yeah with 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 application delivery and operations by pull request in the cloud native space and with this we have com compiled a a a study, right? A maturity model, if you wish, that you can find there just by uh, searching GitOps maturity model in, in, in Google or just uh, typing that URL. I won't go into the depth of it, but I'm bringing this up because the maturity model, right? So the ability to segment people that are extremely familiar with GitOps, right? That are very, very mature at the top with the, from those who divide them in stages, from those at the very, very bottom of it, so very completely new to Kubernetes or, or, or to GitOps in general, and allow us to serve them a, a specific solution to each one of those, right? So at the very bottom are the, the, the people that hopefully are joining today, so all of you or most of you, uh, and to which we have designed a specific tier of our product. So Weave GitOps Core, the free and open source version of Weave GitOps, is designed to onboard GitOps. 
and Kubernetes at large, as you can, as you just realized, or as you probably realized before, but from uh, Kingdon's uh, presentation before, both things are very intertwined. Both things are very connected. And to be honest, my, my, my takeaway from uh, Kingdon's uh, talk just a minute ago is that GitOps is trying to make sense of Kubernetes. Kubernetes raw, vanilla Kubernetes can be a daunting thing. It can be very different uh, from in, in the different distros and the different providers. And GitOps tries to make one experience out of all that difference. It kind of reminds me a bit to, uh, I mean, I don't find a, a parallelism with GitOps with another thing, but I do see a parallelism between um, uh, Kubernetes and Linux in its early days, right? And I actually, I interviewed Joe, Joe Beda, one of the, one of the um, Kubernetes founders just a few weeks ago, and you'll find the episode uh, in our podcast, The Art of Modern Ops, uh, very soon, probably in a couple of weeks. Uh, and he actually agrees with this. I mean, he, he sees uh, Kubernetes becoming the Linux for application delivery uh, of the future. Uh, so it is these people, the people that are trying to deliver a platform, trying to allow their developers to become more effective, to release more frequently, reduce lead time, and become more operationally uh, cloud native. And at the same time, this other bunch of people that are trying to make those increasingly frequent uh, changes and releases more secure and compliant, like TM was just asking a minute ago. So the first thing is to make your development team faster, but then one, once that is achieved, then those releases should be more, more reliable and more solid. Um, it is this application delivery use case and not the ones uh, below that we're trying to solve for with Weave GitOps Core, with the product that David is about to, uh, to showcase in a minute. So that's basically, in a nutshell, what we're trying to achieve. It's built on Flux, one of our flagship products, if not our flagship product, the one that Stacy uh, mentioned at the beginning. Um, it's free and open source. Uh, the minute, I mean, not the minute, but our thinking is that uh, we will provide a product that is free forever. And once that becomes successful in a company and it requires operations to, uh, uh, to, to chime in and provide that secure, replicable, scalable uh, clusters, then we will, we will uh, charge you for that. But if you want to re, uh, uh, do application delivery, you can use it for free. And you can actually get, get going with not only GitOps, but Kubernetes at large with those two commands that you see on screen. So that's all the mindset around, wi uh, around which we've built uh, with GitOps Core. And I'd like David to jump in and actually demo it uh, for us. Um, feel free to ask any questions anytime. We will stop. We won't leave anyone behind. We've got plenty of time and just be sure that We've got a community in Slack that Stacy mentioned at the beginning. Probably we'll mention it at the end. That if you, if you for whatever reason could not make, uh, could not progress to, with that, uh, with us to, uh, today, you can reach out to us anytime over there. So David, take uh, the screen is yours, the stage is yours, and um, unless there are any questions, uh, go ahead. Fantastic. So thank you everyone um, for joining us. Uh, as we've said, we're going to take things really nice and slowly just to go through this getting started experience for using Weave GitOps Core, which as Jordi mentions is our free and open source tier uh, for Weave GitOps, the product which Weave Works build. As you can tell, we like the terms or we like the words Weave and we like the terms GitOps because we created it. Um, a short note, we are going to try something new and fun today and i have recently updated this getting started guide about an hour ago so you are going to be the first group to try it out which is very yes. exciting yes uh, and the picture the reason that we did this if you call one of our earlier demos one of our prerequisites that we used to require was the uh, personal access token to your github account uh, we have since removed this uh, as a prereq, although you can choose to do this, and this is what Flux uses at the moment. Uh, so if you go to a previous version of the docs, you'll see the instructions for using that method. But we're going to try 
uh, what's called the device flow. And this is what the GitHub CLI uses. So if anyone's using the GitHub CLI, it'll look very similar to that. You'll be able to tell that you're on the right version of the docs if you look in the top right corner here. I don't know whether you can see our lovely faces. Yes. I'll shift them away. Uh, there is a main drop down. Um, so make sure you're on main rather than 025, which is our latest release of the, of the project. By the way, David, uh, apart from this upgrade on, on the user experience of the personal access token, the, the whole idea of, of we've GitOps requesting a PTA, a, pers uh, a PAT, a personal access token, is why? Why would, why would a product like ours uh, find that useful or, or require that, actually? Well, it's because we are pushing changes into Git, so it's called basically a deploy key, uh, and we're making sure that we're able to sync the cluster with the Git state, and we need to uh, put down some, some YAML effectively in uh, your Git repo to enable that to happen. Nice. Okay. And we try and do so in a, a secure manner. So the tokens that we're using through the device flow are very short lived, uh, for example, which is quite a nice way to do things. So we still have four prerequisites, but hopefully they're not too daunting. You need a GitHub account and you need a local Kubernetes instance. Uh, the demo flow that we're going to use is with kind, but you can choose a different one should you want to. Uh, if folks could let us know if they don't already have uh, a GitHub account or Kubernetes running locally, that would be great. I'll yeah, let's pause, just pause for a little bit. For, yeah, great. And if you need some time, uh, just let us know in the chat to set some of these things up. We or use we use precisely client clusters because it, it correct me if I'm wrong, but a client cluster is one of uh, a, a a Kubernetes cluster that is able to run in a Docker um, container, right? So it's lightweight, it's very easy, like anything running in a container, and it's perfect for demos, right? Uh, to to instantiate and and keep it up and running very easily. Yep, and you create a client kind cluster with kind create cluster which I'm going to do now just to prove that I have absolutely nothing running currently. <laughs> um, and that will give folks a chance if they're catching up as well. I'm not hearing any objections or seeing any concerns in the Slack. So I'm good to move on. Yeah, I don't see anything as of yet. If you need extra time to get these prerequisites done, please just flag us in chat and uh, and we'll pause and we'll, we'll help you out. Yeah. So the next step, which I have already done, so apologies, I can't show you it live, but I'll show you the steps, is to install the Weave GitOps CLI. So if you click the link in the Getting Started Guide, you will get taken to, uh, this is really annoying, do, 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 do to our install and it gives you a command to copy and paste into your terminal as so i should in theory be running latest so let's check we go version will tell you um the version of the cli that you have installed and the version of flux that it leverages under the covers so important thing to note is that Weave GitOps is an experience that we are building um, on top of Flux. So Flux is the engine room of the experience we're delivering. Uh, it's very battle hardened, production ready uh, GitOps runtime. Uh, we are building something new on top of that to make it even easier to adopt GitOps in your organization. So we will pause for probably a, another minute or two just to let folks download the CLI. I think it's around 90 meg at the moment, but depending on your connection, it might take a little while. Suffice to say that we go the command is obviously the contraction of we get ops. Yes. That's and the fun a... thing for users, I can give you a sneak peek of the future. Yeah, uh, exactly. We, current... go ahead. <laughs> we currently have a proposal where we are uh, integrating a lot of the CLIs that we've worked to provide into a GitOps CLI. So this will be the CLI that is shared across the core and enterprise tier of our product, uh, and will also be integrating profiles 
which is a really fun project if you haven't checked it out yet already. Uh, so in the likely 0.3 release, uh, you may see the WeGo binary change to the GitOps binary. Uh, David, we had a Taros is, is uh, put in a comment here that says, per my prelim tests, uh, installing WeGo uses Flux Go APIs, but doesn't install Flux CLI too. Would you like to address that? So the WeGo CLI actually bundles Flux. So you can drop down into the Flux CLI using WeGo Flux as an example. So if you do WeGo Flux dash H, you'll see uh, the standard help output for Flux. Yeah. Anyone else need some extra time to install the CLI? Mark, did you have yeah, that comment? Yeah, we do install the Flux CLI. It, it ends up in your root directory under a dot we go bin directory in your path. But as David said, you can interact with Flux directly with we go Flux. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. I don't see any other um, comments in the chat, so. Cool. Uh, yeah. so, um, so the next step that we're going to do is to install Weave GitOps onto the Kubernetes cluster. So as Jordi showed in the slide, there are two commands that you need to do. This is the first one. So you just need to run we go GitOps install. And this will basically install all the CRDs, the GitOps toolkit, which is um, the Flux componentry uh, onto your cluster. And this is bootstrapping your cluster ready for GitOps. Or as I it's like to say, few minutes. GitOpsify in your cluster. <laughs> I'm, not, yes. I'm not sure that will, you know, that, that will, um, become an idiom of, a, of sorts, but I like to say that. So the moment we are setting up the cluster and the next step that we will be doing is to establish the relationship between the cluster and an application that is stored in Git. So the two steps to the process. Exactly. So always bear in mind what Kingdon explained at the beginning. One of the core tenets of, 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 of Kubernetes in general is declared state versus or uh, uh, on the other hand, on the other side, actual state, what's running in the environment, not, not necessarily production only, right? Could be any, any. so there's the declared state in Git, in our case, in the case of GitOps, and the running state, in our case, in a kind cluster. Now there's nothing, but it will, there will be something there. Yeah, let's have a look. <laughs> Yes, Taras, yes. Yeah, so at the moment, what I'm doing is I'm just watching on a kubectl get all uh, within the Wego system namespace, which is what we install into. So you can kind of see how things are, are progressing. We're still waiting on a few pods. Those controllers, by the way, are also Flux uh, controllers, right? It's part of the GitOps toolkit, which oh, was apologies. what um, came about with Flux V2. As I'm sorry, exactly. someone exactly. Yeah. can shout at me in the chat if I horribly butchered that. No, no, I think you're absolutely right. Come on. Come We're so close. We're down to the last one. Oh, there you go. The source controller, one of the one of the most important ones, if not the for today's example. <laughs> If anyone else is still running, if it's not just the presenter that's currently waiting on their system, do let us know in the chat. Otherwise, we will start to move on. You've got a question there by Taras. 
So Taras asks, uh, so are controllers then the workers that pull configs from different sources via flux agent config in the cloud? I would defer to Mark for a better answer here. <laughs> oh, I wanted to hear how you were going to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you were. So Taras, uh, basically, yes. Uh, if you look at Flux 2, it's kind of broken up into, into multiple components that are used, and each of those are backed by a controller. So when we go through the process here of configuring Weave GitOps to actually sync an application, you'll see that we create custom resources uh, that then leverage those controllers that are running inside your cluster. But the step that we're running right now, the Weave GitOps install, is the thing that installs the uh, CRDs uh, and then the instances of the controllers ready to do work on behalf of the Weave GitOps command that we're gonna do next. Hopefully that answers it. Thumbs up. Thank you, Mark. So no objections to moving on. Right. So as I said, we've now got the cluster ready. So now we're going to establish a relationship to a Git repository. So the example that we're going to use, you can choose to use your own, uh, should you wish, uh, is the pod info sample application, uh, which is quite common in all Flux demos created by Stefan. Um, we are going to use a specific uh, repo, which is here. I've got the link. Uh, oh, that one. That's the wrong one. We're going to use this one. Chat. This is just the deployment manifests for the application. And that's actually what you want to reconcile between uh, on your cluster, not the source. You don't want to make a change in uh, your application source, which isn't then built into an image and actually part of your manifest and have that trigger a change uh, or try to trigger a change. So this is why we use just the, the deployment manifests in this repo. It's very simple deployment. It finds a namespace of test, and it has a backend with horizontal pod autoscaler deployment and service, and a front end with a deployment and a service. So go ahead and fork the repo. This is, by the way, a fundamental uh, part to fork it. Do not yes, because we want to be pushing changes to um the application so you'll want to have it under your own control rather than try to push to our that's why our demo the, repo. <laughs> that's why the personal access token makes sense right because if we were making changes directly to the um repo that stefan manages he will say who are these people why are they trying to make it no no we need to fork it so create our own copy and then we've GitOps will do pull requests on our behalf right uh, yep. through the personal access token. Well, through the device token in the flow that we're going to show, but could have been through the personal access token, yes. And so, also, I'd like to double down on this. On So pod info, as you just said, is a declare uh, application in a way, right? Some of those YAML files that you just went through, or, or all of them, probably point to a binary, an artifact stored in Docker Hub, right? There must yes. be, exactly. There you go. So this is probably a horrible eye test for, for folks. Um, well, YAML. We are looking at a deployment YAML, and it has a reference to an image. <laughs> yeah, exactly. you might want to zoom in a little if you. <laughs> I mean, it's not particularly exciting. That's but great. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. <laughs> so that is the image that is actually going to run, but it is in a declared state, right? All right. So the important thing, so we're going to clone this locally. Uh, importantly, you do have to use SSH uh, to clone the repo. So you will need an SSH key. Um, if you don't have that, uh, that might take a little bit of time. So let us know if you do get stuck on this step. Uh, I'm just going to create a new folder, clone. <laughs> One day I will tell the story of. No, I... don't worry. <laughs> I, th I think it's much better with the mystery in it. 
yeah, I'll, I'll wait a moment just because of the SSH requirement. Nice. So you forked it into your um, user in GitHub. In this case, again, Sympathetic Moose, that's uh, uh, David's uh, profile, username in GitHub, and now cloned it locally. Not seeing any objections, so assuming we're good to continue, uh, but please do shout. Um, we're more than willing to wait to help out if you get stuck. So if you CD into um, the directory, uh, as I've done, so CD into pod info deploy, we're then gonna run we go app add, which is our second command. Nice. And we're giving it this directory as its context, you can uh, use we go up add and point it at a remote repo in GitHub. You don't have to clone it locally. So this is the new flow, um, which you won't have seen if you've joined any of our previous demos. So instead of using uh, a personal access token, instead we're using a device flow, which is what the GitHub CLI also uses. So you just need to go to this uh, URL, so copy this code, don't copy my code, it won't work for you. Nice. And okay. then this is just authorizing uh, us to have repo scopes. So it's the same as if you were creating a personal access token. Uh, this is short-lived uh, as well. Oh, I took too long to do it because I was talking. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> do you need to repeat that? Authorizing us, when you say us, you mean the CLI, right? Not anyone else. Correct. <laughs> yes, not, not me. You will get a bunch of um, the PRs for me. Nice. There we go. If you don't take so long chatting whilst you're trying to do the, the <laughs> commands, then it doesn't time out and you then get this nice authorization or authentication successful message. Uh, so what this will have done is this has created a pull, uh, pull request. So as we mm -hmm. say, this is operations by pull request. And this means that anyone is able to have a second pair of eyes on the change that's being proposed. This is something that we mirror in all of our interactions. Uh, so if I go to that PR, I can have a look. This is what it is adding into my repo in a .wego folder. So we are. So this is, the, is this the kind of pull request that an application developer would be submitting to the repo owner, who might be I don't know his his or her manager, um, the the owners of the environment, right? Is that is this the flow that you're trying to describe here? And so on, honestly, it will vary. I mean, the example that we're giving here is that we have a single application in a repo, and we are setting up the sync but you may have kind of like a, a fleet repo or like a platform repo which is where all of your deployment manifest lives and then an operations team may set up this this infrastructure already for you uh, so they establish the link between repo and cluster and then you know, individual development teams just have to push their changes to their deployment manifests into that repo and they don't even have to worry about this uh, side of things David, would you mind bumping up your terminal font size just a smidge? Of Thank you. That's no great. problem whatsoever. And uh, just a reminder, if anyone has any questions, if you're stuck, please let us know. I think that that may have helped some folks uh, read your terminal a little bit better. Um, yeah. Just reach out to us in chat. Uh, if, you're, if you're stuck somewhere, if you've fallen behind, more than happy to help you out there. I saw the question from Ravi. I, I'm going to give you a link because this will do a lot better than me try and briefly explain it. Um, although if Mark wants to have a go, he is more than welcome to give uh, a brief intro to the components that get put on cluster. Or anyone else on the call. 
I'm happy to run through them real quickly, the ones that we install, or if, if you'd rather go off and read the link, I don't want to take time away from the presentation. What would you prefer, Ravi? I would say we have we have a few minutes, Mark, if you want to run through them quickly. Okay. Sure. Uh, basically, we install, let's see, six uh, controllers. There's a helm controller, an image automation controller, an image reflector controller, a customized controller, a notification controller, and a source controller. So the source controller, uh, we'll start at that one. Uh, it's listed. I just went alphabetical as it showed as I'm listing them here, but the source controller is the thing that's going to sync between your Git repo repository and your cluster. So uh, when you think of CD and somebody doing the apply to your cluster, that's the thing that's reading Git, the source controller is, and making that available inside the cluster itself. Uh, then once that is available in the cluster, you are going to either delegate to the Helm controller or the customized controller in order to apply the workloads onto your cluster itself. So in this example here, we just have, uh, we have a simple application of what it's going to get deployed is via a customize controller. So it's not going to go through Helm, but if David were to add a Helm workload here, then it would use the same source controller uh, that would then pair it with a Helm, uh, the Helm controller in order to apply that to your cluster. So those are the, the main pieces of the GitOps workflow that we're interacting with here. Uh, the additional ones, the image automation and image reflector controller are used uh, if you want to use image automation. So image automation is when uh, you've set up your GitOps pipeline and you're syncing your manifests and the only thing changing is you're building new versions of your container and pushing those to uh, a Git repository or a uh, an image repository. So what you, what you can do is configure the image automation controller to watch that repository uh, and see new image uh, manifest or so in new versions of your image. When those happen, then it can add a PR against your uh, Git repository in order to say, hey, your image has been updated, uh, which would then turn it through and cycle it back into your cluster. And then the notification controller allows you to specify, hey, when something happens here, I want you to notify. So if I want to configure Slack notifications, I would do that via the notification controller. And again, those are just uh, custom resources that you define, and then the controller is the thing that operates on them. There's a question that David has already answered there. If they are all necessary, if they need to be all of those six controllers installed, am I, and this is, might be for you, Mark, too, Am I guessing that if you if you only have customize uh, or just Helm uh, resources, are those two interchangeable? Let's say that all our workloads are pod infos and therefore run on customize. Would we would would we be would we be able to um, discard the Helm controller operator? Yes. Yeah, it's not necessary if the only thing you're dealing with are customized workloads. But in order to simplify the user experience with Weave GitOps, we want to make all of those available yeah, so yeah. that you're not making decisions later saying, well, I added a Helm workload. Why is it not working? And that's why we, we made exactly. the decision to include these. Yep. And as I mentioned, but if this is something that you'd like to discuss more as a requirement, please either chat to us in Slack or raise an issue uh, on Weave GitOps. So going back to the pull requests that I raised. And whilst I'm doing I'm going to put a watch. Might fail because I don't actually have a name, so it's called test yet. Cool. Um, I'm going to assume that I'm happy with this PR. I'm going to merge it. And I'm going to delete the branch as I don't need it anymore. And then in, I think it's defined as default by about 30 seconds, we should start to see a reconciliation between the cluster and this application. Yeah. So actually, oh, there we go. Well, there you go. Nice. Already started. So to summarize what, we've, what, we, what David has done is spin up a cluster, right? A Kubernetes specifically a kind cluster, right? An easy to uh, uh, 
instantiate the cluster. He has GitOpsified it, right? So run the Kubernetes, the GitOps runtime and the controllers in it. And he has added uh, an application, a declarative application uh, to the cluster and said, hey, you know what? This is the, the declared state. It must, you weave GitOps, please make it match with the, the running state, the actual state, which was empty because the cluster was, was, did not, was not running any applications. Now, what the cluster is doing, what we, we've get up to doing, is making it, making the reconciliation uh, and making those two states match. Yep, that's correct. So if you remember from the, from the sample repo, we have our deployments, which gives us back end and front end part. We have services for both of those. And we have our pod autoscaler, autoscaler, autoscaler. <laughs> um, you can also see the status of this reconciliation with the Wego app. Um, well, actually, I use Wego app. You can do list to view all of your known applications, like ones that you have added in this workflow. You can then use Wego app status and give it a name. So in this case, it's pod infill deploy. It's asking for authentication because we are figuring out the last git commit as well, that's why. So one of the things that we would be really interested in is whether folks prefer the use of a personal access token or this device flow. And mine timed out again, that's, that's being silly. So this in a way, um, mm -hmm. so this in a way is like the first step of the demo, right? Like we've managed to set up a cluster that is GitOpsified and that now is running, and that's, that's what you're checking. Uh, now it's running an application. In this case, pod info, a very, again, for, for demo purposes, a very lightweight application pod info is basically a front end uh, that, we, that we use for, for demos, uh, demos, so so it's it's great. But think of it as your workload, as the application in the that you're working on, uh, and that has a declared uh, format uh, in YAML format, and uh, we've get up, so we'll be taking it to to the cluster. So now, unless someone has put a lag behind, um, what 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 else does we've get up allow us to do with once this is running. So I think what we're going to do next is actually have a look at the application and then we're going to make a change to the application to see that reconciliation happen exactly. uh, as a result. So in order to view the application, you need to do a port forward command, which is step 12 in the getting started guide. So go ahead and do that. Then if you Click here, you will be able to view your application. Pod info. Yeah. Which I think does a little bit more. I think it has like health points, things like that. Can't remember the exact syntax there. So that's our running application. Go down just a little bit if you want to see. There's a thing on the uh, bottom of the uh, pod info application. That's, I think, what you're looking for. Swagger Docs. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think I never scrolled down there. <laughs> Hidden extras. <laughs> yeah. Easter eggs. So I see a couple of comments from Taras. Uh, I believe GitHub tokens are more standard used by other tools integrating with GitHub. And then also, is there a flux command similar to that we go app status command to check on the state of the deployment in progress? Yes, there is. Um, I can stumble across it, but someone else might be able to answer quicker than I can get there. I think it's not exactly the same thing. You have your flux get 
customizations and flux yeah. uses? Flux it's likely that one to get the same output, but you can also do a flux trace, which gives you similar information. So Prakash uh, is asking, will an update trigger for each commit? What happens if I have a bunch of changes that went in with multiple commits? Uh, so you can, I'm going to defer to Mark. Sorry, I just saw him go off um, muted video. So uh, it depends on how you've set up your uh, environment, Prakash. Uh, ideally, what you want to do is uh, group all those commits into a pull request and then merge that pull request as one so that it gets applied to your cluster independently. Uh, and you'll want to do that for things like rollback uh, and reverting changes and are able to control and have a, a clean history. So think just like your source code, having a clean history where you have good commit messages and, and all of that in your repository. You want to do the same thing when you're Git repository. But yes, basically, if you just commit on for in this in, in this example here that we're doing, you know, we've pointed the GitOps at the main branch. And that's why when we do merge a pull request, as David walked us through, uh, once he did that, then we deployed the pod info. But if he were to make changes directly on the main branch, each commit could result in changes in your cluster. And the reason I say could is we're pulling, uh, it's the polling interval that we're, the source controller is looking at your repo. So it may not pull each individual commit because it may get a, some of them grouped together, but depending on that, that interval. And Ravi asks, uh, does it natively support Git repos like AWS code commit? Prakash says, thanks, Mark. Okay. Yeah, it, it does not support AWS code commit today. Today we support GitHub. We're working on adding GitLab and we'll be adding other providers as uh, demand requires it for us. Yep. First milestone is the Git gang, which would be GitHub, GitLab, uh, those two, basically. So now we are going to make a change. So okay. let's do, now we're just going to do a commit, right? So if I do, so this is the beauty of it, right? That's why I was I was saying at the beginning that it's meant that this uh, we've GitOps core is meant for developers, right? Because with two commands, you have been able to spin up a cluster and GitOpsify, right? Maybe you don't need to speed, uh, spin up one a new one. You just need to GitOpsify an existing one, right? But from then on, you will work as a developer in your applications, in your workloads, in the stuff that you know about, and you will roll your CI pipelines just like you usually do, and then let Weave GitOps take those changes to the environment, right? Which is what David is about to do now. We've got pod info up and running. That's our application. That's what we know about. Our domain knowledge is codified into pod, pod info. And uh, and you know what? We're working day in, day out and adding features, correcting, you know, fixing bugs and stuff. And we want someone something that rolls it out for us. So what are you going to do, David? What what don't you like about Pod Info as it is right now? I think it's far too pretty. Ah. So I'm going going to change the color to be an abhorrent gray. <laughs> okay. And I've done too many. So, so you're using VS Code, as everyone can see, right? Yes. Although you can just use the GitHub. Uh, yeah. Web UI or your editor of choice. Uh, it's a code spaces. Old habits die hard and I use code. No, it's fine, absolutely. Uh, I'm going to do... If you don't mind while you're doing this, I'm just going to ask a couple questions that are, that are coming in here. Uh, would it work with private Git deployments is one. Yes. And Ludovic also is asking, how do you orchestrate upgrade on, let's say, a database before upgrading the app? Oh, wow. That's a tough one. How do you orchestrate upgrade on, let's say, a database before upgrading the app? 
I'm not sure I get the question, to be honest. And I'm not sure the... I mean, I, I'm not sure if Mark or David has any insight into it, but I, it might be... Um, the question might be a bit of out of the scope of this demo, to be honest. In my view. Hey, it's a it's a great question, and it's a common question around when I'm building this microservice application. So if you follow the the twelve factor patterns, so twelve factor .net, ideally all of your microservices should be able to be upgraded independently. And so what you would do is, you know, your app would be able to read both of the old database schema and the new database schema, and then you could update. And then when the database gets updated, it can take advantage of that sort of thing. Uh, you can use dependencies or depends on in Helm. So if you were to deploy your application with Helm, then you could require an updated version of the Helm dependency, which could then upgrade your database prior to doing the, the operation in there. So there's, there's quite a few uh, techniques you can use there for dependencies uh, when dealing with them. But yeah, so it's a, it's a bigger question. It's a great question, um, but it is a bigger question oh, yeah. with multiple knobs to turn uh, on that That's solution there questions that can come up underneath like what happens if something goes wrong or um how do we roll back can we even roll back the database it's a very complicated um there are, there are uh, helm hooks probably the biggest uh hand wavy answer if you want to say how how do i approach doing this inside of the pipeline uh well if you're using helm there's a uh, post upgrade hook that you can run once all of the pods have been upgraded. Um, so you can be sure that all of them are prepared for the new database upgrade. Uh, but again, it's totally out of the scope of this demo. But Although we will see rollback very simplified, not, not like Kingdom was describing now, just in a minute, by the way. Hold on, because David will show it in a minute. So what are you doing, David, there? So I tried using GitHub CLI to do a PR, but because I haven't played with it, I clearly did it wrong. So I jumped into the web UI and raised it that way. So this is my PR, which means someone could have a look at it. And if they agree with it, they can merge. So again, like this is, is one of the most powerful things that we see in GitHub. So it's just that, that second pair of human eyes. A lot of, what was that 90% of issues that happen are human error. <laughs> so just enforcing that within your organization, that peer review is a really powerful thing to ensure that mistakes are avoided, uh, let alone that you have to try and recover from them. Mm. So I agree. Um, and do the merge. And if we okay, do so now watch. So now we GitOps has, has detected the change. Correct me if I'm wrong, right? And, and it detects there's drift, obviously, because now the declared state has changed. And the running state, which was, what was it purple, the original color? Yes. That you changed? Now there's a mismatch, right. Yeah. right? So now with GitOps, we'll try to reconciliate, which means yeah. applying the changes that the one source of truth that is hosted in Git, the declared state, is actually reconciled with the running state. So we will see the, the changes applied. Uh, yep, so Kubernetes is currently doing its thing. It span up a new pod. It waited for that to be ready, and then it terminated the old pod. So if I do a refresh, we should now have a fairly horrible gray, if it works. No, demo. It's all gone wrong. <laughs> By the way, Tardos, Tardos asks, it, it noticed that your, uh, your file extension is .yaml, and uh, I've seen others that use .yml. Uh, would your CLI's tools work with both? That's a funny, I've asked myself that. I never cared to ask like voice it, to be honest. Maybe Mark knows. I'm not sure, to be honest, what's the difference between dot .yaml, dot .yaml, and dot .yml. 
I, bu I believe it's just preference. I, I, I think could be so wrong too. there, but and yes, it will work with both. That was why I needed to restart the port forward. See, this is why you read the instructions and in the getting started guide. Oh it helps you God. avoid these Cutting errors. Corners. <laughs> but I did guess it, so it's okay. <laughs> there you go. Nice. Yeah. So now we have this horrible gray. Um, so let's pretend it's a, it's a bug. You, exactly. you created a bug, David. So what is it? Let's do mean time to recovery and let's see how quickly we can get this back to back to a good state. So we are domain experts in pod info, but hey, request. we we're not we're not um, we we make mistakes like everyone. So rollbacks like Kingdom was describing it a minute ago, or the rollbacks that we've GitOps and GitOps in general allows us for are very quick, right? Correct. So I've merged my reversion of the PR. A new pod is already spinning up. This time I will remember to restart the port forwarding. And the new and the previous version of the declared state will now be over. Uh, there and there we have it. Back to the good last good known state. <laughs> exactly. So this is so, one of the biggest beauties of it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So hopefully folks have seen that this was very easy to, to bootstrap a cluster, to set up a, a relationship between a repository and said cluster so that any changes that you make in Git as a declared source of truth or a single source of truth uh, become your desired live state and your enforced, continuously reconciled live state in Kubernetes. Yes, well, thanks, Thank Taras. So this is a very simple demo, of course. We've used a very lightweight cluster, very lightweight application. Uh, but this is this is how how the product uh, operates in general, right? Uh, uh, and it's it, it makes uh, app delivery, app rollback, everything related to the app delivery lifecycle. Uh, very easily done from within Git, whether it's, whether it's, I mean, it has to be done through a Git service, GitHub, GitLab in very, very few weeks or days rather. Uh, but your development environment may be, you know, the S code like David's, um, Sublime, uh, mine of preference is at Atom, I don't know, whatever. And uh, so long as it goes through those services, then you can manage as a developer, you can manage your application changes, your application lifecycle very, very easily. And it gets deployed, rolled back, and everything uh, from with uh, from uh, with GitOps. It's very easy to set up and uh, and that's it. And, and just yeah. uh, if, if we have a bit of time, um, sorry, go ahead, Mark. I was just gonna say just a, it, I'm probably being a bit too pedantic, but if you look at the history of the Git repo, the, the rollback is actually a new commit on top of that change. So you're always moving forward in time in your Git repository. And the nice benefit of that is you see that, hey, I made this change and exactly. then I had to revert it. And having that history is, is because there. The new, commit, the new commit has a commit message that probably, hopefully actually explains the reason the context, right? Why that change was, was applied. I mean, hey, you know what? It gives you a, a history, a timeline of what of what happened. And that that's a, a real treasure for managers, for auditors, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. We still have a fair bit of time. So if folks have questions, feel free to, to put them into the chat. Um, since we do have time, I will go off piste and I will show some new stuff, which is still in active development, still progressing, but a nice, nice little teaser of where we're going. So by popular demand, <laughs> we have a UI. Oh, beautiful. So this is still in early days, um, but you can try it using version 0.25, which is the released 
uh, version of Weave GitOps Core. So this is available for everyone to give it a go. Uh, once you have an application, this gives you a GUI to have a look at it. You can see everything that is associated with that application. So here we have the backend service, front-end service, the, the flow that actually creates the pod uh, for the backend, similar for the front-end, uh, the pod autoscaler, and some of the, the specifics to Flux that allow us to do this reconciliation. You can also see the latest um, applied revisions. Uh, so you can see which, when your application was last updated. So, so this, is, this is something that is evolving rapidly. Um, you'll soon be able to do uh, listing all the Git commits and deep links into Git so you can quickly view your application history. You'll be able to authenticate using that device flow, uh, the same as I demoed through the CLI. Uh, and this UI is what we also embed within our enterprise products where you start to get cluster management side of things. So you can see how we're truly building a tiered offering here. So this web app is just running on my local uh, machine at the moment. It's not exposed elsewhere. We release it very soon. But yeah, as David was saying- well, so This is released. <laughs> um, oh, apologies, yeah. So the one thing that will be changing is we won't be running the UI locally. We will instead run it uh, on the cluster as a shared instance. But this is the, the early stages to it. And I thought it might be fun for folks to try out. Yeah, exactly. So again, going back to the real life, example that we described before you don't usually manage an application as lightweight as, and as simple as pod info you manage several you contribute to several applications to several services and this sort of view gives you a bird's eye view perfect of the status of the declared and actual state of both uh, of, of of those both stages of all the applications right and all the controllers and drill down into this specific repo that is being uh, reconciliated. Uh, should there be a, a problem or should you know about the team that is behind that repo and actually take action and see what's the latest commit? Should it be rolled back, et cetera, et cetera. And there we have it. So if there's no further questions. Um, thank you so much everyone for joining. Thank you, David. Thank you, Jordi. Uh, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Kingdon, and thanks everybody for attending. We will follow up with an email uh, with the link to this recording. Um, and yeah, if you have any other questions, if you didn't get a chance to walk through it with us live now, and you're going back and going through it, watching the recording, uh, hit us up on Slack. We're more than happy to help you, uh, you know, there as well. So thanks everybody, and uh, have a wonderful day or evening. You too. Take care Take all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.